Well, welcome class. Uh, today, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday on parts of the spectrum. Um, so today, we're going to explore how, how light can reflect where electrons are at. And so we're going to try to explain that in Bohr's theory of the atom. But it all starts with understanding what light is. So of course, you remember light is part of, it's a wave. It acts as a wave. It has a wavelength. It has a frequency. So you, of course, remember from the song that it goes radio waves. And radio waves have the largest wavelength and lowest energy. And then, of course, it goes microwaves. That's mu. Infrared. And then you have visible light, which is Roy G. Biv. And then we have, whoops, we have uh, UV, X-ray, and then gamma ray. Okay, and those are the parts of the spectrum. This would have, this side over here would have the largest wavelength. This would have the highest frequency. This side would have the lowest energy. This side would have the highest energy. So then what we did yesterday is you should know that C equals lambda times nu, where C is the wavelength and nu is the frequency. Frequency is measured in hertz. It is how commonly it, it repeats itself, how many cycles per second. And uh, wavelength is measured in meters. Okay, so for this problem, it says a microwave oven has a wavelength of 1.54 centimeters. What is its frequency? So you're going to use this. So V is equal to, nu is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So the speed of light is, you can store it in your calculators, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth. And then the wavelength happens to be, so you're going to have to get this into meters. So 1.54 centimeters to meters, it looks like you're going to divide by 100 centimeters is in one meter. So you could put 0 0.0154 meters as your answer. So then you're going to get your crust, trusty, not crusty, but trusty calculator out. And you're going to type in the speed of light, 2.998 E8, or you have it stored in your calculator, divided by 0 0.0154, and you get a frequency of 1.95 times 10 to the 10th, and you could either have it as per second, which is the same thing as a hertz, or a hertz. Okay, now, the next thing what they're going to try to do is they're going to ask you to do the energy per photon. Okay, so you're going to need to know this formula, where energy is equal to this is per photon, energy per particle is equal to H times the frequency. Okay, so what is H? H, and you want to store this in your calculator, is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules seconds. And basically that's how much energy each particle of light or a photon possesses. And it could be a photon of radio waves, it could be a photon of microwaves, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. So in this problem, what you're going to do, and we should probably store this as H in your calculator again, because it's super easy to have. You're going to find the energy, E is equal to the Planck's constant H times 1.95 times 10 to the 10th hertz. Okay, and that's this answer from a previous question. So it's typical in this one that you use this formula and this formula together to find different portions of it. In fact, you could substitute uh, frequency for like C divided by lambda. It means the same thing. So then what you're going to do is you're going to take your answer from the last one times 6.626 E negative 34, and you get 1.29 times 10 to the negative 23rd. And so it's energy, so it would be measured in, see how it's joules per second, and this is a per second, so it would be measured in joules. Just remember, energy is in joules. Okay, so that's how much energy is per one photon of this light. So that's not very much. I think of this as, you know, 22 zeros ahead of that. So that's a tiny mark. So usually what they'll do is they'll shoot a mole of that. So we're going to take our previous answer when it says per mole of photons, and we're just going to take that answer that we just did, my answer, times Avogadro's number. Because, you know, a mole of it would contain Avogadro's number of photons. So this times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd gives me 7.77 times, actually, times 10 to the 0, actually 7.7. Uh, it would just be joules, okay? So that is a typical problem. See, we can actually know, if you know the frequency, if you know the wavelength, if you know the energy, 
using these two formulas, C equals lambda times nu or E equals H times nu, you can figure out where, what, how much energy it has, what wavelength it has, what frequency, all of those things, because they're all connected by those two beautiful formulas, this one, which we use a lot, and this one as well. So understanding um, the frequency, the wavelength, the energy of different parts of the spectrum helps us to better understand why the colors showed up in the first place yesterday when we did that awesome demo. Okay, so this brings us to this, which is emission spectra and the electron. Okay, now... When you're doing chemistry, we're going to oftentimes, and I'll probably even throw one of these out live since I have it, it is totally common to see something like a neon light, okay? So like a neon light is just basically they actually put literal neon in and then they electrocute it and you get a cool color. Each element produces its own color, just like what we said um, yesterday when we, we burned stuff and they all had interesting different colors. So wind current is passed through a gas at low pressure the potential energy of some gas increases. Okay, so if you've ever gone to the beach and it's super duper hot, and you know how you run to the ocean to get in the water because your feet are burning. Think of it like that for the electrons. See, when they're getting electrocuted, they actually go up to a higher energy state and something occurs that produces color at this one. And we can actually analyze the color to figure out the energy state of the electron. So color actually indicates what's going on with the electron. It's fascinating. Okay, so here's the first, first couple things. First off, you need to understand that the continuous spectrum is a rainbow. Uh, so this is white light. And if you take white light and put it in a, um, so if I put it here, let me, let me get a different color here real quick. I'm just going to go with something easy that will glow, glow in the dark. Okay. And oops, I got to go back here. All right, here we go. So if you take white light, Okay, which is right here. And then you put it through a spectrum, it'll it'll split and you'll get the whole rainbow. So you'll get all of Roy G. Biv. Okay, but if I take, and this is really, really interesting, if I take a gas like neon or like argon or any other gas, and if I put it through a spectrum, I don't get the full spectrum. I get what we call an emission spectrum, where only parts of the colors of the rainbow are present. And so you get these little bars, and those bars, each one represents like a fingerprint of what type of element you have present there okay so let me go over here so the interesting thing is that every element has their own emission spectrum everyone has their own individual color and you can identify the element by what lines that are produced and it's a way of identifying them okay so take a look at this this is what elements are present in the star so you have star a and you're trying to and this is the light that you see from star a and you can totally totally tell that it has, it looks like it probably has, okay, so you can see it has a mark here. So it looks like it has some helium in it. Do you see how it has some helium in it? Because the lines match up. Plus it has this line here and this line. So you can match up and find out that this star definitely, definitely has some helium in it. Okay, does it have anything else? Okay, so let's take a look. So it looks like it has something, uh, see how the lines kind of match up here? So it looks like it has some other elements in it. So it definitely, definitely looks like it has some, some hydrogen in it. So it definitely has helium and hydrogen and probably has a few others. Let's see, I'm matching them up here. Maybe it's just hydrogen and helium. We'll pause and we can talk about it. So pause the tape and just take a look and see if whatever's matching up. So basically you just match them up and find out what's inside. And this is how they know, these are called emission spectrum. And this is how you can tell what's inside our stars is because each element produces its own light. Now, there's a scientist around the time, you know, 1920-ish, a quantum scientist, um, who was curious about the different colors. And so he proposed a model. And this is our first kind of idea of, of what the electron is actually doing. And so with his model, he was able to calculate that the, there are different energy states around the, the nucleus of an atom. And he was able basically to tell the first quantum number, which is the principal quantum number, which tells us what energy level it's in. Okay, so this brings us to something called the ground state versus the excited state. Okay, you are in a ground state if you're just totally chilled out, right? You are in an excited state. And I used to go to the games and kind of sit to the side and just, you know, you could see you guys are like at football games, kids are like in class are kind of like normal and 
boring. But you go to the football games, people are crazy. They're like throwing powder everywhere. It just it's wild times, right? And I think kids are missing going to the games this year because of this dumb pandemic. But you know, think of it this way: in a ground state, the ground state's like you're at school, all right. In school, you're just kind of there. And then excited state is like, hey, I'm at an awesome concert. I'm at a game. You're just going crazy. Okay. Now, um, your typical state is the ground state. Excited state, something has to occur to get you into said state. Okay. So here's what happens. All right. If you are an electron and you are either put on fire or electrocuted, what happens is you go up to a higher state. This is this process is called absorption. Okay. So absorption, absorption. So basically you're going up. So incoming energy is causing you to go up and we call these values discrete. All right. So these are, it goes up and absorbs a discrete or exact amount. Now you can't stay in the state forever. So eventually you're going to fall back down. And when you fall back down, that energy has to go somewhere. And so what happens is on the way back down, this is called emission. So emission is when it goes back down, it has to release that energy and it releases that energy in the form of a photon. That photon can then be measured for energy and you can find the frequency and the wavelength and you're able to tell where the, you're almost like mapping the atom out. You can tell where the energy levels exist. You can tell all about the atom just from the light that it emits. So light is actually really, really super duper cool. And it tells us so much about where the electrons are at. Okay, so we call this, This is these are called the, the different series. So um, Bohr was able to calculate, and, and you know, depending on how high the jump was, you'll get, you know, if it's a really high energy jump, remember that UV light is higher energy. And so it'll emit a photon of UV range if it's from like one to two. Whereas the Balmer series, which is the one we focus on, which one we can actually see, and I'll probably in lab put a, a little vial of hydrogen out, and you can actually see the emission spectrum. These lines actually represent, these are what you'll see down here. So there's like a red one, a yellow, a blue, you know, all these different colors. And you can see that they'll actually represent the atom jumping from like six to two. So this is the second energy level. Now you notice that this this jump is actually physically bigger because there's more energy as you get further, you know, as you, uh, it takes more energy to, uh, to increase N equals one versus N equals two because it's closer to the nucleus. So it takes more. And then this one is IR because look, as the, you get farther and farther away, it's less energy to remove electrons and get them excited. So when you're seeing atoms and seeing cool colors, what you're actually seeing is you're seeing excited electrons jump and fall. Okay, so you can see that n equals three to n equals four. So that's three to four. If I'm going up, that would be absorption. If I'm going down, that's emission. So n equals two to one, this would be emission. This would be emission. This would also be emission. This represents the greatest one because you can see that there's a large energy gap here because you're close to the nucleus versus here. Okay, so I'm probably gonna go do a couple other cool demos and things to show you. And then we're gonna explore uh, the flame test, which is essentially the same thing, where you are exciting electrons. And as they get excited, they jump up to higher energy states. And when they fall back down, that's when they emit light. And it could be light that we can actually see, or it could be you know radio waves, microwaves, it doesn't matter. It's the energy difference that tells us um, what's being emitted. And it tells us about the structure of the atom, which is the point of this. Okay, let's close up shop and then we'll come back to this um, and look at it a different way. All right, the end.